Hey there. Um, so I want to address a post that uh, is a good example of Galatian error. Um, Brother Dave shared this. He's on a quest to let everybody know that uh, everybody needs to be concerned about rewards and obedience. Um, now, he... Look at this. He's, he did a post yesterday. Any professing grace community that teaches other believers that obedience to exhortations in Scripture doesn't matter uh, and that they're not important to believers' life after salvation are in direct denial and opposition of Scripture. Such double speak and false accusations of placing others back under law in order to avoid clear exhortation in Scripture. It doesn't matter how someone says it. The truth is clear, and God asks us to be obedient in spite of our failures along the way. I'm not speaking of salvation. I'm speaking of how we're instructed to grow afterwards, which some in the grace community flat out reject. Okay, and then he uses Ephesians 4, uh, which he never teaches. He's never taught on Ephesians 4, but very clear instruction and exhortation to put away how you once walked when you were lost without Christ. Clear instruction to the born-again believer to walk in a new life, uh, as we grow in grace and obedience to God's word. Now, he is totally focused on the self there. I mean, again, he's got Ephesians 4 completely out of context. He doesn't care for Christ and the church. So we talk about Christ and the church. Uh, we talk about the building up of the body of Christ. And Ephesians 4 is about walking worthily of your calling and putting on the new man. Uh, he just looks at it as obedience. Okay. That's how he thinks. Um, again, he had, he doesn't have teachings on this, on how all he, all he sees is we got to tell people to do it. And if you don't tell them to do it, then you're contradicting the scripture. Now we do tell people to do it. That's the thing. So he lies about our teaching uh why why doesn't he fear the retribution he promises for breaking the commandment thou shalt not lie when he lies about our teaching and says that we teach disobedience because we don't teach disobedience uh no what we teach is that we are not under law and we are not under the carrot stick system. Uh, we are not under a wage system and we're not under a debt system. And that what we live out of is what Christ has already secured for us. We are not trying to earn what he's already secured for us. We enjoy what he's already given us. And that produces the fruit of the Christian life. But from Brother Dave's point of view, no, you work and then you get uh, the blessings in the Christian life. Maybe. And those would be rewards. And now he says that this is, uh, he says, I'm not speaking of salvation. I'm speaking of how we're instructed to walk and grow afterwards. Well, you can say that, Dave, as if you're grace, but don't forget, you just came on my wall a couple days ago and rebuked everybody there and said that uh, retribution awaited at the judgment seat for apathetic Christians, They need that we needed to fear retribution at the judgment seat and that that should motivate us to a holy life. Well... <laughs> That, if justification, again, does not cover me at the judgment seat, what good is it? So he has a mixed, messed up view uh, of the Christian life. He does not rightly divide the word. And he is under an incoherent mix of law and grace, which is Galatian error. Um, which is 99% of Christians today. And it's, you know, the te this is the standard teaching Christianity. He's just a little more rabid than, and vocal about it than most people. Most people hold these views, but they're nicer about it. 
he goes around and beats people. Uh, that's why I blocked him on my wall. Um, but he's, you know, this is not somebody who's ignorant of my teaching. This is somebody who's been listening to me for a couple years and knows that I teach about practical holiness in the Christian life. Uh, I teach about Christ as our life and living Christ for the building up of the body of Christ. I just don't attach it to threats of punishment and uh, seeking a wage because that's not what motivates the Christian life. What motivates the Christian life is presenting the bridegroom. We betroth, it's a betrothing ministry. We betroth people to Christ by presenting him as the one worthy, uh, by extolling his virtue and magnifying his person and his work so that people see how good he is and what he's done for them and what they have in him. And we tell them about their position as sons and heirs, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And as we do that, the spirit that they have received, the spirit of sonship, bears witness with them and as they, with their spirit that they are sons and heirs and testifies concerning the truth of Jesus Christ and the law of the spirit of life in them operates to set them free from condemnation and from the uh, law of sin and death and from the spirit of bondage and fear and brings them into the atmosphere of sonship and liberates them and quickens them into function. And what that function looks like is a feast. It's the prodigal coming home, not to work in the field, but to be brought into the house for the feast. And the feast, there's the fatted calf and there's the flurry of activity of the stewards who, in the father's house, prepare the feast. It's all about the feast. But the slave outside and the older son who thinks he's supposed to be a slave, working out in the field, keeping commandments, can't understand that that feast is, number one, not a reward for work, not a wage for service. Uh, it is a, a inheritance and a right and a blessing for the sons of God, who God enlivens. It's only enjoyed by those who the Father gives life to. And he had the life of God, or the life of the Father. He was a son and an heir, and he could have had the feast at any time, but he wouldn't come in and have it. And he resented the younger brother, who he viewed as, well, he just spent the inheritance, and he squandered all the father's you know, inheritance on riotous living and prostitutes, and now he gets the feast? And yet the feast is the service. So the more we talk about the feast and talk about the riches in the Father's house. And the more people enjoy it and enter in to the blessing, the angrier the elder son gets. The elder son wasn't angry until the son came home. He was out there working, keeping the commandments, having a good old time, doing what he thought was service. It wasn't until the prodigal came home and the feast started that he got angry. See? And that's what this is. We, we're in the middle of kind of a revival. Uh, well, we're starting, we're entering into a season of refreshing um, where people are really entering into a, a, the pasture. They're coming out from under the thieves and the robbers that have stolen their assurance. They're coming out from Galatian error. They're seeing that Christ is the reality of the Christian life. He is their righteousness. He is their sanctification. He is their reward. They're sons and heirs. They're brothers together with Christ. They're complete in Christ. And they're not going to let anyone steal their crown. And they've been nursed to health on Christ. And they're feasting on him. And they're enjoying the fellowship. And the word is so clear. Well, what it's ha what's happening is that those who are they're, they view their Christian life in terms of wages and rewards are getting angry. 
the more we speak about it, the angrier they're getting. Because they really believe that all the blessings in the Christian life should be the reward for their toil. Uh, now, they'll say it's not for salvation, you know, it's for your growth. But they always speak about commandments and obedience. They never speak about Christ and they don't know how to motivate themselves or anybody else with the goodness of Christ because to them, Christ is the hard taskmaster. How do we know that he's the hard taskmaster to them? Well, listen to them talk. When you come on my wall and threaten people with retribution at the judgment seat for being apathetic, <laughs> uh, and you are talking to people who are, you know, especially on my wall, where at least 40% of the longtime subs, I would say, seem to be bedridden. I mean, I don't know why, but God has chosen to bring a whole lot of people to my wall who are uh, have chronic health issues. And, and I believe it's because God has brought them into weakness so that the power of Christ can tabernacle upon them and so that they can discover Christ in their weakness. And they are. And these are fruitful people. It's just that you don't recognize the fruit. Because you don't understand, you don't, when you see people washing each other's feet and encouraging each other in the Lord and enjoying the Lord, you don't look at that as service. You look at that as waste. You're like, you know, when, when the alabaster box got broken open and the perfume was poured on Jesus, you're like, why this waste? It's a waste that could have been spent on the poor, but that's a memorial to the gospel. Give it all to Jesus out of love, not because it's worth something, not because of anything other than your love for him and it's for his burial and his resurrection. It's for his, it's to show forth his death, <laughs> you know, it, and our death with him, that nothing in this world matters, only him. That it does not compute to a wage earning, uh, debt slave or a taskmaster or a hireling hirelings only care about their wages um so anyway in true form he shares this post really dumbed down from some uh what's this from faithalone.org okay so they must be grace yeah well this is galatian error what is galatian error uh, and you know, I have new subs, but Galatian error, Schofield is the one who, who just, who used the word Galatianism in his notes on Galatian error. He said, uh, that the Protestant church had become thoroughly Galatianized and that the law had not been given its proper place as a ministry of condemnation of cursing, uh, you know, it, that, that the proper place in God's counsel is that the law is given as a ministry of condemnation and cursing to reveal sin. But in Protestant and Catholicism, uh, Protestantism and Catholicism, the law, we were taught that we could keep it, and by the Holy Spirit's help, we may. So the law is taken out of its proper place. Um, you know, we know from Timothy that the law is not for the righteous, but for the ungodly. And its ministry is to teach you your need for Christ by showing you the ruin of the flesh. The law never com really does not commend anything. It's a witness against you. The very fact that I have to tell you, do not lie, means that there must be something wrong with you. Okay? Uh, I don't have to tell Jesus not to lie. Why? Because it doesn't even, it's not even something in his nature that needs to be spoken to. I don't want to tell Jesus, don't have any gods before him. Why? Because he loves the Father with his whole being. He's a burnt offering. Okay, the fact that I have to tell you those things means that you're fallen. The presence of the command means you're already guilty. It's already a diagnosis of your nature. The presence of the law is a witness against you. You know, you go into a house and you look on the fridge and there's a notes all over the house. Maybe, you know, don't leave the fridge 
open and you look at the sink don't leave the water on and you look at the light switch and it says turn this light off and then you go up to the kids room and the door says on the door it says clean up your room clean up the pick up the do not i don't want to see any toys on the floor when i come up uh you, you you go into the bathroom and you go and you see a sign that says flush the toilet right uh or no may, maybe even make it more descriptive like the toilet is not for uh leaving your you know crap all over <laughs> and you go into the kids room and there's a sign that says you know moldy cheese covered uh and yogurt and 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 shake and ice cream c brewing uh bacteria is gonna make you sick i better not see more of that <laughs> you look at all these notes all over the place you would think boy these people are slobs what in the world there has to be notes all over the place because you know there's no uh can't these people just clean up after themselves i mean you get the idea the, the presence of the notes shows that there's a flaw in the family uh or or you could say that maybe the, the, there's a nazi in the family <laughs> uh but the point is that the law is a witness against what's going on that's why there's no law against the fruit of the spirit. What can you say against the fruit of the spirit? Love, righteousness, peace, kindness, meekness, joy, humility, self-control, gentleness. There's no law against that. In other words, there's nothing to, for the law to say to it. The law is a witness against. So the incoherent mix of law and grace for the Christian life produces... Nothing but confusion. And that's what Galatian error is. Galatian, the Galatianized Christianity is an incoherent, confusing mix. Where people, on the one hand, they go, well, I'm going to heaven. But on the other hand, they think, I, I'm afraid that when I get to the judgment seat, I'm going to, I fear retribution. On the one hand, I know I'm supposed to love Jesus. On the other hand, I'm afraid if I don't, he's going to beat me. Uh. He tells me to love him, but if I don't, I may be in outer darkness. And there's all kinds of variations of, you know, if you say, what is it? You're going to suffer loss and not have a reward. Then you get the groups like the GES Society, which is supposedly real Gracie, you know, Zane Hodges, I think as well taught uh, this. And I was under a group that taught this, that, well, the reward is the kingdom. And so if you don't have the reward, where are you going to be during the kingdom? Well, then they go back to the parables of Jesus and say, you're going to be in outer darkness during the kingdom for a thousand years, weeping and gnashing your teeth, watching Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sit down while you suffer. Really? <laughs> That's the position of a son and an heir? See, the what Galatians does is it corrects the error that you are at the same time a son and an heir and a slave working for a wage. Galatians tells us you are no longer slaves, but sons. This, this, the, you're not come to Sinai. You're not being asked to go produce an Ishmael with Hagar by going back into the law. You're not working for a wage, for a blessing. Uh, you're not trying to earn the blessing. You've received the blessing by the hearing of faith, and the blessing is the spirit, which is the source and the fruit of the Christian life. Uh, and the spirit comes by the hearing of faith. The spirit is Christ himself, the real Isaac. Uh, and we're children of the promise, and we've been baptized into Christ, and we are co-heirs with him. We are Abraham's seed and children of God because we are uh, one with the one who is the seed to whom the promises were made. And that uh, those promises were confirmed by a covenant that God made not with us, but with Christ himself. And Christ is the seed to whom the promises were made and the one with whom the uh, covenant was 
cut, which means it's entirely based on his faithfulness and he's already entered into it. And our salvation and our inheritance, our position as heirs, is totally secure. And as far as, you know, feasts and law, and he calls them weak and beggarly elements, he says, why would you, being sons and heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, because you're sons and heirs, you've received the spirit of the Son in your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Why would you go back to the weak and beggarly elements, seeking to be brought back into bondage? And the bondage there is to be slaves. Why are you, as sons and heirs, seeking to be slaves? See, this is uh, right divi rightly dividing the word. Understanding that the revelation of the mystery. And Paul starts Galatians by saying, look, I received a gospel that no, that was not given to me by men in Jerusalem, but by the ascended Christ. And he revealed to me Christ in me, the Son of God in me. And he revealed me something that was unique, which is that I died to the law, through the law, that I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that I've been baptized into Christ and have put him on. And my position before God is not as an individual apart from Christ. My position before God is, a, is as a joint heir with Christ. In fact, it's reckoned as Christ himself. Whatever Christ has is what I have. Uh, he's given me the spirit of his Son. He's exalted me to the highest place as a son and an heir. And it's from that position that I live. If I go back to being a slave, I bring myself back to the position of working for what I already have. And that's called being bewitched. So he says, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Christ is evidently set forth as crucified and he started the thing by saying, I marvel that you were so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another, only some would seek to trouble you, seeking to pervert the gospel of Christ. They were taking the gospel of Christ, the real gospel, the saving gospel, and perverting it so that you weren't complete. They were taking justification and making it irrelevant for the Christian life and saying that justification, the way they do it today is saying justification is just for you to go to heaven, but you're still here as a servant or a slave working for the blessings, working for a wage. And at that time it was, well, you need to be circumcised. If you're going to be a Christian, you need to be circumcised like Abraham so that you can keep the feasts. And they and the reason they did it was because they wanted Gentiles to go up to Jerusalem so they could show off that they had Gentile converts to the Jewish religion. That's what they what he meant when he said, well, look, they want to make a show of you in the flesh. Um, if they could get them circumcised, then they could get them into the feasts. And that by getting to the feasts, then they could take them to Jerusalem. And then they could say, look at all these converts I made to who are who believe in Jesus and are zealous for the law. See, if you just believe in Jesus, I don't have anything to show for my work, so-called. Right? That's why G Paul said, you know, if I still preach circumcision, the offense of the cross is gone. Uh, they they uh, wanted to preach circumcision so that they could have a whole parade of people following them around with obvious signs that they were really doing this thing. And when we take away the outward signs, the feasts and all the observances, now it's less apparent that I have disciples and less, I have less to boast in. It takes away my ability to boast. <laughs> you know, how can you see that someone really loves Jesus? You can't. Uh, I don't, you know, it's, it's a matter in their heart. So 
what these people wanted to do is say, no, we, we know that our disciples are really doing this thing because they're keeping the feasts. Well, today it's, well, we know that our disciples are really loving Jesus because they all went to the conference and they all went to the mission trip and they all go to church and they all tithe. And it's a lot of the pastors, you know, uh, they basically got everybody in a cage like it is, I call it a zoo. And they're standing outside the cage talking to another pastor and say, yeah, you know, I, I saved all these people. They were wretched sinners. And now look at them. They're all in the, they're all, look at them now. And they're all miserable in there, but I saved them. You know, it's, it's a, it's a zoo to show off their trophies of their zealous work for the Lord. And they have their reward. They think they're going to get a reward, but they have their reward. The few people who said, wow, you're really doing it for God, that's their reward. Because Jesus said, if you do it before men and get their applause, you have your reward. Now, some people think that they're really serving God and, and think that God's going to reward them with a wage for what they're doing. Uh, they may be disappointed because they may be building with wood, hay, and stubble just because they are doing it for a wage. Um, the wage system is part of the law system and it's presented in the scripture as valid, just as the law is presented as valid. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about with the Galatian error is it mixes law and grace. And what modern Christianity has done is it's highly formalized this system to say justification before God is a matter of going to heaven, but justification on earth, from James primarily, is for rewards, and it's by works. Justification by grace is for going to heaven. Justification by works is for rewards. Uh, and rewards is a wage for service. Okay, so as, as far as going to heaven is concerned, you're a son. But as far as living your life, you're a slave. Now this produces a mix that does not settle the conscience. It keeps people in a spirit of bondage and fear, keeps them under condemnation, and keeps them in the flesh, keeps them perpetually slaves to men, and uh, keeps God in the position of the hard taskmaster, clouds their view of him. So for the, for the most part, it produces condemnation because it brings people to Sinai. We haven't come to Sinai. Uh, or it produces wolves and hirelings, thieves and robbers. And only, you know, again, in the sheepfold, you only have the option to be a few different roles. If you're going to serve, you're either a hireling, which means you don't care about the sheep. You only care about your wage. You could be a sheep. But if you're serving and you're a hireling, it's because you don't care about the sheep. You only care about your wage. Uh, if you're a wolf, you may not be a believer and you're there to devour the sheep. Uh, if you're a thief and a robber, it's because you're there to steal crowns, steal assurance, rob people of what they already have in Christ and rob their sense of blessing, which is what had happened in Galatia, by taking away the key of knowledge. Uh, and depriving people of the knowledge of who they are in Christ and what they have and who he is and what he's done. Or you can be a porter, which is just to be someone sensitive to the shepherd's voice and opens up the door of the word so people can enter the pasture. A limited set of roles. We want to be the right person in this, in that little picture, you know, but the porter is going to not, is going to be free from Galatian error. That's the first thing you got to see it's grace through and through. And if you want to talk about rewards, it's got to be in grace. If you want to talk about service, it's got to be grace. Paul said, if you're going to run the race, you have to follow the rules. And this whole thing about rightly dividing is really important. Uh, the reward system that mixes law and grace and puts me back in the position of being a slave for my life relies on the synoptic gospels and the parables of Jesus 
and tries to fuse them with Paul's doctrine, which is a, the revelation of a mystery which was previously hidden but now made known uh, first through him in doctrine, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, and the church as the expression of Christ, the, uh, the body of Christ to be built up, the habitation of God, the masterpiece of God, the fellowship. Um, and that is built in grace uh, through a stewardship which can only be handled by sons and heirs, co-heirs together with Christ. And that stewardship is a distribution of the New Testament, because of the death of the testator has occurred, uh, riches, which are the unsearchable riches of Christ himself, everything he's accomplished and everything he has entered into, all things that the Father has are mine, and now he shares them with his brothers, the church. We are co-heirs together with him. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies with him. We've been seated with him in the heavenly places. All things are ours. And when Paul ministers to the church, he ministers to them as from that position and being in that position, even when he's rebuking them for carnality. Like even in Corinth, when he's talking about, look, you want to be slaves of men? You are divisive. You're saying, I'm a Paul, I'm a Cephas, I'm a Paulus. You're walking as mere men. He says, "All th don't you know that all things are yours? Whether Paul or Cephas or things present or things to come, life or death, don't you know that angels are going to minister to you? You're going to judge angels. Why are you walking as mere men? He says, we're, j we're nothing. We are just servants for your sake. You are seated at the table. You are the heirs. Why are you dividing over servants? You are the heirs. You're com you, you are complete. And what he was talking about was the false teachers who had come along with their law mixture to make them slaves and steal their crown. And he said, you'll tolerate it if they slap you in the face. You know, but they were then rejecting Paul's ministry and the revelation. They were carnal. So they didn't understand their place in Christ and Christ in them. And because of that, they were dividing over who could be associated with the supermen of God, who were nothing, but they made great boasts, you know. And so it's in that context, by the way, that Paul talks about loss of reward for people who damage God's building, he says, you are God's building. You are God's field. And he says, yeah, I as a wise master lay, uh, builder did lay a foundation. But Paul watered, you know, Apollo, I planted, Paulus watered, but God's the one who gives the increase. We're nothing. Yeah, we'll receive a reward, but uh, everybody better take heed how they build. Because if you damage God's you know, you are te God's temple, and if someone damages God's temple, they'll be destroyed. Now, he was talking about false believers crept in unaware who were bringing saints into bondage, bringing them into captivity, bringing them into this incoherent mix of law and grace and stealing their crown, bringing sons of God into slavery through law teachings, among other things, and causing them to walk carnally. And not as sons and heirs. That was the source of all the problems in Corinth. All the carnality and all the sin that was manifesting in Corinth was because they did not see who they were in Christ. And the way Paul ministered the rebukes to them was by showing them what they have in Christ and who they are in Christ. In every case. You know, even the case of fornication. Don't you know that you're the, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and your body is members of Christ? Don't you know that you're making your members of Christ the members of a harlot when you go into a harlot? He who's joined to the Lord is one spirit. So the richest revelation of our union, union with Christ, one of the richest in the whole New Testament, is in the context of a rebuke to carnal believers about fornication because they need, as the solution to their problem, to see what they have in Christ. 
Their sin does not diminish the reality of who they are in Christ. And the solution to their sin is to see what they have in Christ. And so as a servant of God, that's how Paul ministers to them. Now, that's Paul, a betrothing minister, who is not presenting the hard taskmaster, but the beloved bridegroom with and the brother who has purchased us with his blood and made us co-heirs together with him and given us everything. And he is our pattern. Paul is the pattern of how we minister. So if you want to talk about obedience and service, you have to take Paul as a pattern. And these people like to ignore that. Um, but the, the wrong division comes from taking the synoptic gospels, which is Christ as the minister to the circumcision, speaking to the Jews uh, as a Jew born under law to confirm the promises to their fathers concerning the kingdom and to demonstrate that he is the seed to whom the promises were made with signs and miracles that demonstrated his authority and to show them that he is the one the scriptures promised and give them a chance to accept. Of course, they rejected him, right? But, uh, when he spoke to them, they were still outside of him and under law. So he used the law as a schoolmaster to show them their need for him, for salvation, to show them, hey, you have not entered your kingdom. You can't enter it without me. If you don't believe in me, you will not enter. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you're not going to enter. And you want to be my disciple? Well, you can't even do that. Uh, that was the point of discipleship is to show you it's impossible. If you having an army of 10,000 have an army coming against you with 10, uh, 20,000, you don't go to war. You ser seek ser uh, terms of peace. Likewise, unless you forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. Meaning what you bring to the table is not enough. And the, even the people who were his disciples learned by observation, the one thing they learned was, I cannot do it. <laughs> I abandon him in his time of need. And he is the matchless one because he continually, in front of them, did impossible things that they could not do and then said, well, the disciple will be like his master. What? <laughs> it must have been so intimidating. He was tireless. He never lost his patience. They lost their patience with children. Children come up and they get away. He's like, no, suffer the little children come to me. I mean, they reacted wrong in every situation. They never understood anything he said, and they certainly couldn't reproduce any of his works, except in special circumstances. And any time they did, they were confused as to why they were doing the works. It was just a mess. What was he doing? Well, discipleship was an intensification of the use of the law to bring them to an end of themselves faster. Why? Because they're going to be his apostles and his witnesses, and they're going to start the church. And the church is built on being crucified with Christ and recognizing, I have nothing and I can do nothing. It's got to be Christ in me. But that had not yet been revealed. He brought them to an end of themselves. And that ultimate end was when they all scattered and he was alone and was crucified for them. And Peter definitely was brought to an end of himself, seemingly, through that experience. Although 10 years later, he still had the issue mentioned in Galatia, where he's still under a mix of influence. And the, brother, and the men from James came from Jerusalem, and he shrank back from the Gentiles, fearing those of the circumcision. He's still under a mix in his conscience. Well, maybe, maybe I'm wrong for exercising freedom in Christ, you know? And he had to be rebuked publicly by Paul. Uh, but Paul's rebuke revealed the nature of the Christian life, which is, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. And the life I live is by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, not the taskmaster, and gave himself for me, not asked me to give myself for him, 
I'm not a slave giving myself for him. He became a servant and gave himself for me. Everything's flipped around. <clears throat> and he supplies himself to me as the Spirit. Furthermore, he's, I've been baptized into him. And because I'm in him, he's the seed to whom the promise is made. He's the one with whom the covenant is cut. I'm a child of God and an heir, and I've received the Spirit of the Son. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a servant. I'm no longer under the law. I'm not under the carrot stick system anymore, working for a blessing. Why would you go back to the weak and beggarly elements, desiring to be in bondage when you've been made a son and an heir? Don't you know that the son of the bondwoman was cast out? Don't be like Ishmael and Hagar. Be like Sarah and, and Isaac. And Sarah had to wait for Isaac in the time of life because only God could bring her forth. And that's how the Christian life works. It's supernatural by the supply of the Spirit. And we wait eagerly by the Spirit's help for the righteousness that we hope for. And what we are looking for is the fruit of the Spirit, not the works of the flesh. And you guys are producing the works of the flesh thinking you're going to earn a wage for them. But I'm telling you, the works of the flesh are manifest as envy, jealousy, provoking, beating one another, biting and devouring one another, and then ultimately, all the carnality is going to come out. Fornication, adultery, lasciviousness, witchcraft, heresies, strifes, and that was what was happening already in Corinth. And Corinth had the same problem as Galatia. It was the same group of people that was stirring it up. It is these law ministers that go around and bring people into captivity. It's the thieves and the robbers and the hirelings and the wolves that go around and steal babes' crowns. The crowns of people who are kind of new in Christ and don't realize that Christ is the entirety of the Christian life. And that the entire Christian life is a gift and it is an inheritance and a blessing given freely to the sons and heirs. And when you don't realize that, it's easy for somebody to come and tell you, oh, Christ is the taskmaster, and you need to work for, for his blessing and approval. Oh, okay, I thought there was something I had to do. Oh, yeah, you, you're going to heaven when you die, but if you want to be blessed, you need to go to church and, be and tithe, participate in the mission trip, uh, maybe work in the children's ministry, and they get you working for them. Eventually, you're working for man because man is building something for himself. He says he does it in the name of God, but he's doing it for himself. Even if he's doing it for a wage, even if he's motivated by reward, it is his appetite that he is serving, just like my dogs who are working for treats. Again, when they go outside, it's not because they're wanting to potty. It's because they know if they come back in after they go outside, they get a treat. And that's my own fault because I tried to teach them, oh, go outside, I'll give you a treat. And now they've learned, okay, I'll just pretend to go outside and then I'll come in and get a treat. I, that backfired on me. You spoil, <laughs> you spoil them if you weigh work just with wages. Uh, God wants to work deeper than that in us. With the sons, he doesn't work by the carrot stick system. That's for children who are not fully grown, who are under the, uh, under the schoolmaster. But now that faith has come, we're reckoned as full-grown heirs, and we're not under the schoolmaster. We've come to Christ. And what he does is, yeah, he wants us to participate in the household affairs, but not because we get a wage for it, but because we delight in our father's interest it's our interest the building work of god the new jerusalem is our home it's our estate it's our field it's our joy paul said are you not our crown and our joy and our reward at his coming paul has just as much interest in it as uh god does he's invested not because of a motivation by reward in fact if you look into paul's writing you will find that he didn't expect a reward for it because he, he had been given a dispensation. He said, look, if I do this willingly, 
then I would have a reward. But I do it unwillingly. That means the dispensation is given to me, so I don't get a reward. So what I'll do is I will offer it freely. <laughs> and that's my reward. It was a really interesting turn of speech in there. But uh, he was not doing it motivated by reward. And see, dogs can't understand that. We think dogs are our best friend. And they do love us, okay? But... Really, they're motivated by their own appetites, and that's what a hireling is. And that's what I talked about yesterday. You know, I have no one genuinely care, care for your estate, for all seek their own things and not the things of Christ. They don't care about Christ in the church. I only care about my wage, and that's a Balaamite. They want to speak for God. They want to work for God, but they want to do it for a wage, and they can be bought and sold. Okay, so this is, this is a hireling's... Uh, way of looking at the Christian life. This is Galatian error, okay? And this is a very simplified uh, look at it, but I'll show you the contradictions because, it, again, it's an... Uh, Schofield said it is a incoherent mix of law and grace, and I'll show you why it's incoherent. Did you know one of the most common reasons for teaching a works salvation gospel? So this is, oh, this will get me free from, grace, uh, free from works based salvation. It pretends to be grace. And it's dumbed down. Look how dumbed down it is. Train your Bible brain, right? This is obviously intended for people who are not super grounded in the scripture, who need to be talked to like a 12-year-old. And remember I said the pastors. Why do the pastors talk to you like a 5-year-old, like a 12-year-old? It's because they want to keep you on the milk. They know once you graduate to meet, you don't need them anymore. Uh, and you'll stop paying their tithe, which is their salary. But uh, that's one of the reasons. He says, did you know, but uh, th these, kind of, these kind of bait and s bait systems should only work for babes. You should grow out of this. Okay. If people, are t if you're still reading, if you're, if you've been a Christian for 20 years and you're still reading articles like this at, to inform you about the Christian life, uh, there's something wrong intellectually or. You know, you need to grow out of this. You need to, these are, ba this is baby talk. Um, this is talking down to you. This is patronizing you. And it's, it's full of, it's, it's an oversimplistic, wrongly divided, leavened, Galatianized view of the Christian life. Uh, did you know that one of the most common reasons for teaching a work salvation gospel is when a preacher doesn't know the basic distinction between eternal life and eternal rewards. Okay, never heard of it? Well, if you haven't, consider this. Now he separates eternal life and eternal rewards. Eternal life, he says, is apart from works. Galatians 2.16, Romans 3.28. But eternal rewards is by works. Look where he goes. He, Matthew. So he goes to Paul for eternal life, synoptic gospels, and revelation for eternal rewards. Eternal life is a gift, Paul. Eternal rewards, a wage, Luke, synoptic gospel. Eternal life, a present possession. Okay, John. Uh, now, John is a mystery gospel built on Paul's truth. It's all about Christ in you. It was a, it was a gospel for the church that had actually been uh, turned from Paul's ministry by the Judaizers. All, Paul said, all the churches in Asia departed from me. And John's ministry was to recover the church back to the simplicity that's in Christ by presenting him as the fountain of living water for our enjoyment. He dwells in us, in John. That's different than the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's not outside of them as the taskmaster. He's in them as the bridegroom. Uh, but he's the eternal life. Okay, eternal rewards. Future possession. Now, he, he mentions... 1 Corinthians, this is where he gets it from. Now, ironically, though, 1 Corinthians 3, everyone who uses that to talk about rewards doesn't understand what rewards is because they don't understand what building is and they don't understand what the service in God's house is and they don't know what it means when he says you are God's farm and you are God's building and what it means to build with gold, silver, and precious stones and that God gives the increase and they don't know what it means when he says, if you destroy God's building, God's going to destroy you. What the nature of the rebuke is. They don't know what wood, hay, and stubble is. 
How do I know that? Because they threaten retribution to saints for being apathetic at the judgment seat, which means they don't understand the judgment seat at all. They, the mystery of the judgment seat is exactly that. It was a mystery hidden in the time of the synoptic gospels. And when they threaten retribution at the Bema seat, they have to lean on the synoptic gospels to do it, which show a picture of the guy bearing his talent. A couple other things where there seems to be a whipping post, you know, in the parable. Now, that's a parable, not a doctrine, but the church is not in view there. The church is a mystery. And the Bema seat does not happen on earth. It happens in heaven, and it is a celebratory victory day where Christ is presented with his inheritance and presents his inheritance, the reward of his work, to the Father and says, Behold, I and the children which you have given me. This is the glorified masterpiece of God, my crown, my jewel. And yes, we are there, and the results of our labor are there too, which is the saints. And there's a memorial uh, to the incorruptible things that were wrought through our service. But our service was in grace, and it wasn't motivated by reward and wage. If it is, it's burnt wood, hay, and stubble and burned off. It's gone. It's motivated by a betrothed heart that sees the preciousness of Christ and glories in his accomplishment. Uh, and from a thankful heart dispenses the riches of Christ, the inheritance that we already have, the knowledge of that inheritance, to the saints so that they enter into the enjoyment of it, which is rightfully theirs. The inheritance we have is already given to us in Christ, and our ministry is to help the heirs exercise their right to enjoy it. Not by telling them they need to earn it, but by showing them they already are qualified. The law minister tells them they have to earn it, whereas a grace minister shows them that they're qualified for it and shows them how and presents Christ as their righteousness, Christ as their sanctification, Christ as their reward. And as he does so, their hearts are drawn to Christ. And as uh, their hearts are unveiled to behold him, they are transformed into that same image from glory to glory. And something of Christ is wrought into them as a weight of glory an exceeding weight of eternal glory, uh, which will be revealed in the next age as part of the building. And that's the New Testament ministry and what it produces. And it's a New Testament ministry, not a covenant, meaning it's not two parties with obligations on either of them. you got to do this and you got to do that. It's a testament. The death of the testators occurred and there's an inheritance we are sharing in. You have been qualified for a share of the allotted portion of the saints in light. Here is the description of the inheritance. Let's read Ephesians. <laughs> and here's how you are qualified. You were walking according to the course of this world. You were an alien, uh, alienated from God. You were hostile through wicked works. You were an heir of wrath by nature, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved you, even when you were dead in sins, has made you alive together with Christ and seated you, raised you up with him and seated with you with him in the heavenlies in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward you in Christ. You are accepted in the beloved, you are foreknown in him, you are a, a predestinated unto sonship through Jesus Christ. In love he chose you from the foundation of the world to be holy and without blemish before him in love. You are accepted in the beloved, you have redemption and forgiveness of sins in him. If only you could see the riches uh, of God, the glory of God's inheritance in the saints and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. And you've been sealed with the spirit of promise, who is the pledge guaranteeing the redemption of the purchased possession. This is a guaranteed deal, this inheritance that you've entered into. And you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, and you are seated in the heavens with Christ. And he's become head over all things to the church, and everything in your life is working according to the counsel of his will. To head up all things in Christ, and make him head over all things, 
for his body, which is the church, which is his fullness, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And you are being built up in him to become a habitation of God in spirit. This is God's dwelling place forever, this inheritance that you've become a part of. And this is your inheritance. You're inheriting God and God is inheriting you. This is your position as a son and heir. And Paul says, this is my ministry to uh, make known what was previously hidden, this mystery, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and make known the economy or the fellowship of this mystery among the Gentiles. And this is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this is a whole new thing that was not revealed, even when Jesus was walking on the earth as a minister to the circumcision. And so we don't go back and, and borrow from the law to try to patch together a system to motivate the saints because we think they're lazy. And that's what these people do. Uh, okay, so he says, eternal life is a pos present possession, but rewards are a future possession. And he, again, bases it off 1 Corinthians 3, uh, which I guarantee they have no understanding of what 1 Corinthians 3 is about, which is the building god's inheritance and they don't understand what the nature of the work is like i said the new testament ministry which reveals the riches of christ for the building up the edification of the saints they don't know what the new testament ministry is uh and then he says eternal life is certain but rewards are uncertain Okay, and then he says, you would never confuse a present with a paycheck, right? Then don't confuse eternal life with eternal rewards. Okay, now he's got further teaching on this, and, and maybe he goes deeper, all right? But based on this, I see some incoherent things. Uh, just real basic. If you're a son and an heir, which is what it means to have eternal life, means you've been brought into the household of God and God is your father. You've been given the spirit of the son, crying, Abba, Father. You've been made a brother and a co-heir together with Christ. And the eternal life is the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, and it is the fellowship. Uh, it, the declaration of the eternal life was so that you may have fellowship with the father and with the son, and that your joy may be full, that you may know that you have the eternal life, uh, it is the spirit in you testifying of who Christ is and that you are a son of God and an heir and a joint heir with Christ, an heir of God. All things are yours. That's the point that you share Christ's position, not your position, Christ's position. You're like Mephibosheth, who has, because of a covenant David made with his father, Jonathan, been seated at the table, not because of he was poor in Lodabar, but and lame and couldn't do anything, but he got raised up and seated at the table, not because of anything that he did, but because of a covenant that David made with somebody else. And this is because of a covenant God made with Christ. And all you did was believe. Just like Abraham, uh, who was justified because he believed and then fell asleep when God cut a covenant with Christ. He was asleep while God the oven and the torch passed through the pieces and said unto your seed, which is Christ, I will give this land. And Paul says that we were baptized into Christ, who is that seed. And that was the gospel that was preached to Abraham. And that's the gospel we believed. And when we believed, we were baptized into him. We became Abraham's seed, but we also became sons of God. Why? Because Christ is also the son of God. He's not just the seed of Abraham, he's also the son of God. So we became not only the earthly blessed ones like Adam, having dominion over all things on earth in the king, age to come, but we also got raised up and seated in the heavens at the right hand of God, above angels in Christ. Our position's as high as you can go. That's why it's so pathetic to go back to the weak and beggarly elements. Now, none of this was revealed in the Synoptic Gospels. When Jesus is talking about coming back on the earth and setting up his throne, we are hidden in him. This group of people and their destiny is a hidden mystery. And he is speaking to the Jews about a wage system according to the law to tell them that 
Look, the only way you can experience a wage, if you want to work for God, is to see that the wage is entirely out of the generosity of the master, not based on your service. The 11th hour laborer is going to get the same wage as the guy who worked all day in the field. And when the guy who worked all day in the field says, that's not fair, the master is going to say, what, is your eye evil because I'm generous? You agreed for a wage and you got your wage. Okay, now there's a couple things there that's revealed. Number one, it's not the length of time you work or the effort that you put in that gives you a wage. It's that you agreed for this and this is what you got. Number one. Number two, somebody else's wage is the same. <laughs> it's equal. Uh, and it's because of the generosity of the master. It's by grace, not by work. And grace is not fair. But also, one thing I want to say is that the wage is certain. He said you agreed. Right? Who works for a wage but doesn't know what their paycheck's going to be. I don't. I don't ever sign up for a job and not know what I'm going to get paid. But here, what do they say? Point four, the wage is uncertain. This is incoherent, okay? You are a son of God and an heir. You have everything in Christ, and yet you are to go line up. Okay, you've been adopted into the family. Now I want you to go outside and get a shovel, and get in line, there's a taskmaster, and I want you to get the task from him, and you're going to work for a future possession from him. Uh, you're going to work for a wage, but you're not going to know what the wage is. And this is what's going to motivate you to be a good and holy child in my household. Do you see how incoherent this is? Number one, are you a son or a slave? Well, in the New Testament, based on Galatians, we're clearly sons and heirs, not slaves. And he makes that point emphatically. Number two, even if you were working for a wage, who would work for a, uh, you know, even in the wage system, you knew what you were going to get. And yet, when these teachers present the wage system, they have to make it uncertain. Why? Do they do that? Well, it's because they don't understand what works get the wage. And this is the other thing. When you ask them, well, then how do I get the reward? If it's uncertain, what works qualify it for it? They don't talk about the building up of the body of Christ. They will talk about the Great Commission, uh, keeping commandments, not sinning, sinning less, not doing it perfectly, you can't do it perfectly, but at least giving it a good try. <laughs> Refraining from uh, speaking evil, you know, they'll go to James 2 and talk about the tongue. We, I, I wasn't sure, I don't think it was, really, somebody posted uh, a thing talking about rewards. I don't think it was from this site, but it was the generalized Christian teaching. That was a patchwork of random things that they just plucked from the scriptures that actually had nothing to do with rewards. And one was from, I, I taught on this a couple weeks ago. Uh, one was from Romans six that said, uh, and they said, well, you'll get reward for sinning less for overcoming sin. And they borrowed from Romans six, which clearly tells me I can't overcome sin. I was a slave to it. It's stronger than me. And I had to die to it. And then they grabbed, and the only way I could die to it was in the death of Christ. God had to baptize me into me, into him. And I had to die to law too. So, uh, but then they grabbed from uh, James 2 and said, taming the tongue. And it's funny because James 2 tells us very clearly that no man can tame it and we all offend. Uh, and then they mentioned the Great Commission, which depending on the translation, some will say is teach the nations all that I've commanded you. Others will say, uh, uh, make disciples. And some will, some translations say baptizing them. Some don't, I think it's, so there's confusion over that too. Uh, and depending on what group you're with, 
they're going to have arguments about what that means. How many disciples do I have to make? All nations or just some of the nations? You know, uh, but the, the point I made was that the ones who, to, who use these verses as rewards, notice that they set something in front of you that's impossible. They pick the verses that are specifically tell me that it's impossible. Romans 6 tells me it's impossible to overcome sin. Um, it's not a matter of overcoming sin. It's a matter of dying to it and then being raised to walk in newness of life. That's supernatural. How can I get a reward for something supernatural that God does? I'm going to get a reward for God's work? Well, actually, in grace, yes, but they don't understand that. Uh, and then James, no man can tame the tongue, and they say, I'm going to get a reward if I can tame it. They set me before the Herculean impossible tasks and set me to doing them. Why? Because then they can get me on the treadmill for the rest of my life trying to do what's impossible. If they gave me something that was easy that I could check off and say, I did that, then I could say, well, I'll get my reward. And now I don't need you to teach me anymore. And I don't have to keep paying you and I don't have to keep tithing you and coming to your church anymore. No, what they do is they tie you to a system that's now never ending with an unspecified work and an unspecified wage. God would never do that. Even if you were working for him uh, for a wage. Even in the parable, in, I believe in Luke 19, the guy knew the wage he was working for. He said, you agreed on a wage. You knew what you were going to get. But they say here, the fact that you're going to get a reward is uncertain. Do you know how much... See, the people who sincerely understand the requirements of righteousness know the awfulness of fearing the judgment seat. The people who think that they're going to get a reward for their works don't. They, and it's because they have not really looked at themselves in the mirror to see. Like, you know, down here he says, uh, uh, he says, God asks us to be obedient in spite of our failures along the way. Okay. No, it's not your failures along the way as if you're just not perfectly following. It, it, you are disobedient. Let's call it what it is. It's not, fa it's not that you're obedient and there's failures along the way. Let's call it what it is. You are disobedient. If you have failed along the way, you are disobedient. If you want to measure it the way you're trying to measure it, by law. But under grace, there is no measurement because we died to the law and we were crucified with Christ and that system is out. The system of bait and uh, bait, carrot and stick, wages and debt is out. Now let's look at justification from Romans 4 and I'll wrap this up. There's a whole lot more I'd love to say about this, but I gotta, this is 70 minutes. I gotta wrap it up. Uh, what shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found out. What is the flesh? The flesh is the totality of who I am apart from Christ. It includes not just the sinful, bad things I did uh, with the nudie magazines. No, it's uh, what Paul said is, you know, if anyone had confidence in the flesh, I more. Righteousness in the law. Zeal for God. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Right? All that stuff that he eventually had to count as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. All that's flesh. He says, um, what then shall we say if Abraham our father has pertaining to the flesh is found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has something to glory but not before God. Now here's where you can just redefine justification and say, well, that's talking about going to heaven. If he was going to heaven by works, he'd be able to glory by God. But he, he's not going to heaven by works. He has eternal life by grace. And that's what these people do. But he says, what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, 
his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Comes this blessedness upon the circumcision or uncircumcision only, for we say that faith was reckoned to God, uh, Abraham, for righteousness. Now, there's a, something called blessedness here. What is this blessedness? Well, the blessedness made Abraham an heir of the world to come. And we find that out in Hebrews, which says that there's a great salvation that subjects the world to come, not to angels, but to the heirs. And this blessedness is the great salvation and the inheritance and the reward. It's the whole thing. And it is not by works, okay? But it is by uh, uh, grace. Now, to him that works is the reward reckoned for grace, not, uh, not of grace, but of debt. In other words, if you work for it and say, well, I earned that thing, then you that what you're saying is God owes it to me as a debt. He's in debt to me because I worked X amount, therefore he has to give me the kingdom. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly. Now to work not means I didn't do anything. Not only that, but I'm ungodly. It's See, this is our confession. D Brother Dave says, uh, God commands our obedience in spite of our failures. No, it's not in spite of your failures that you're obedient. You are disobedient. If you want to measure by that, you have to say you're disobedient. And that's what Abraham and David said and what Paul says. The law tells us that we are all guilty before God. That is its conclusion. Now that we are saved, we don't go back to the law and measure ourselves again. If we do, we find ourselves cursed, cut off from Christ in our experience and measured as guilty and disobedient again. And everyone who takes it up is disobedient. Number one, they're an adulterer. They've gone into Hagar. They're producing Ishmael. They're sowing to the flesh. And they're putting themselves in the position of a slave. And the slave is unprofitable and will be cast out of the house. It doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation, but you're not enjoying the blessing. Now, which I'll get to in a second. But uh, to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him for righteousness. Now, the ungodly, see, Abraham, we don't see the scripture condemning his sins, although he sinned a lot, but he wasn't under law. He wasn't under the microscope. So you don't see him groaning and weeping about his sins, but he sinned a lot. So did Jacob and, you know, but you don't see because the law had not come, they were not in sackcloth. But David lived under the law and we have all his songs where he's like, cleanse me with hyssop. Oh, put a right spirit in me, right heart in me, all that, right? It's because he lived under the law, but he was still justified by faith. And he lived under the law to, as the schoolmaster to show him he was ungodly and could not be qualified for the covenant that God confirmed with his seed, which is the same as the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, uh, that would set up his throne forever. Okay, And that was his blessing. Abraham was blessed. David was blessed. To be blessed is, on the one hand, to be qualified for the age to come which is the reward and the inheritance is to be an heir of the great salvation. But it is also to have your sins forgiven and that God doesn't impute your iniquities. So that means that if you are under grace, when Christ comes, it is without sin unto salvation to those who look for him. There's not going to be a whipping post where he's going to remember all your sins and beat you for them. And he's promising you threats of retribution. Abraham and David did not fear retribution when they died and resurrected to be in the presence of the Lord. Okay? And we shouldn't either. That's an antichrist teaching. It's contrary to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and what the scriptures reveal about the nature of his coming and his reward. Um... 
But the Lord does not impute sin to us. It's not there. How did he do that? Well, he blotted out the commandments of ordinances that was contrary to us. All things are lawful to me, actually, but not everything is beneficial. Now he appeals to me based on what is beneficial. Beneficial for what? For the building up of the body of Christ and the fellowship. And he appeals to me based on my position as an heir, and he opens my eyes to see what I have in Christ, and that motivates me to a service. But that service is my enjoyment. It's the feast. And that's something that I, I don't have time to talk about here, but I talked about it at the beginning of the message. And this is something that's hidden from the eyes of the carnal people who are veiled by the law. Uh, and yeah, I do speak strongly. You know, the time is short. We're, we're, we're no longer reasoning with people. You know, Jesus is coming back very soon. And it's time for people to repent. And if they're caught up in this wrong stuff and they're going around beating people, it is not the time to uh, sweetly reason with them, take them aside. And these are people who think they know it all, okay? And are, and are teaching and are in a position of authority to rebuke whole communities and all that. So, no, I don't have any feeling like, oh, well, shouldn't you be nicer to these people? No. Um, the ones we should care about are the, are the babes in Christ whose assurance is being attacked because what we do have a charge to do is hold fast to what you have and let no one steal your crown. And you have a crown. There is a don't let anyone steal your crown. There is you have need of confidence, uh, which has great recompense of reward. And John said, now little children abide in him so that when he appears, you will not be. You would be confident it's coming and not shrink back in shame. And the love of God perfects us so that we may have boldness in the day of Christ. He wants us to be confident. You cannot be confident with an uncertain future and an uncertain wage given by a capricious taskmaster who's not giving you the details. You don't even know what the rules are. And this is what the incoherent mix of law and grace does, is you don't know what the terms of service are. You don't know what the wage is. You don't know what the service is, what the terms are. And therefore, even the reward is uncertain. And it should be. The reason it's uncertain is because if you're honest, under the system of the taskmaster, just like with the law, you don't know if you've done enough. Jesus even said, after you've served the master and he sat down and you've given him the meal and you've done everything you want to say we are an unprofitable servant we've only done what was expected of us i mean even if you did it all you haven't you've only done what was expected of you why should you get a reward for that the wage system is a dead end just like the law is a dead end just like the uh discipleship is a dead end the point is that there has to be another system revealed. This one is a dead end. The flesh doesn't work. If Abraham something had something uh, justified by works, he would have something to glory of in the flesh. We're talking about what is the flesh versus what is the spirit. And that's what uh, Galatians really comes down to. We can walk according to the flesh or according to the spirit. If you walk according to the flesh, you're like Ishmael. You're going to be under the law, trying to perfect yourself in the flesh. But the reason you do it is because you don't see that justification gave you everything. Now, there is a future blessing, but justification qualified us not just for future blessing. And this is what the so-called Galatianized grace does, is it separates justification from the present and puts it in the future. Oh, eternal life, that's for going to heaven. But now, justification is a matter of works for reward, which are yet future and yet uncertain. That's incoherent. Am I a son or a slave? Am I working for a wage? And if so, how much is it? Can't tell you. It's uncertain. <laughs> I can't even tell you if you're going to get it. Is it because the taskmaster is dishonest? No, I just can't tell you if you're going to work hard enough. Well, how do I know if I work hard enough? I don't know. Well, what do I do to do the works? Well, you can overcome sin and you can keep your mouth shut. Well, James says, I can't tame the tongue. And Paul tells me that no man can overcome sin. 
I had to die. And if I'm dead, how am I going to work? You know? Well, just shut up and go to church is what you need to do. Listen to your pastor. Shame on you. Apathetic Christian. You're just looking for a license to sin. No, I'm being honest with my conscience and with the word. I'm in fear and trembling. And I see the dead end the, at the end of what you've provided for me in your so-called teaching. And I, want, I need a way of escape. I'm like the guy who sees I've got 10,000 troops and there's an army coming at me with 20,000 troops and I'm looking for turns of peace. That's the wise thing to do. I'm counting the cost. You got up and started working. You never counted the cost. You haven't seen, you started to build. You're like the guy who started to build his tower but didn't have the resources to finish it and everybody can see it. Uh, unless you forsake all you have, you can't be my disciple. <laughs> but justification is not just for future justification is for now and this is what they've done is they've redefined justification to exclude the christian life so that they can make you work for what you already have and the the blessing you know it said abraham was blessed david was blessed you say that's it subjects the world to come to them that's true for them but we have an even better position because after the resurrection of Christ, Christ received the Spirit. This was still a mystery. And became the life-giving Spirit. And imparted himself as life and made us one body. And even though we still live in the earthen vessel, we have received the Spirit, which is the Christian life. It is Christ in us. And he calls this the blessing of the gospel. He says in Galatians 3, Even as Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness, know you therefore they which are of faith are the same of the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the nations through faith, preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. He's talking about the blessing. So then they which are of faith are blessed, are blessed with faithful Abraham. As many as of the works of the law are under the cursed. Uh, why? Because cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things of the law to do them. That's the thing. You don't get to cherry pick. You either do it all or you haven't done it at all. Uh, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. For it is evident the just shall live by faith. The only way to live before God is by faith. Okay, the law is not of faith. You're, you're doing it. And they say, oh, that's just the ceremonial law. No, the ceremonial law binds you to the moral law. The Sabbath connects them. The fourth commandment, keep the, keep the Sabbath, connects the moral law and the uh, ceremonial law so that they're one. If you want to keep circumcision, then you've got to keep thou shalt not covet. Good luck. <laughs> uh, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, as it is written, curses everyone hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham, remember, Abraham is blessed. David is blessed. Does that just mean subjecting the world to come? which is the reward promised in, ju in the justification in Romans. Uh, if the reward was of works, it would be a debt. But no, it's by grace. What is the reward? It's the world to come. Uh, which he actually spells out in Romans 4. But there's also an additional thing, which is the blessing of Abraham might come upon the nations through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, this is what he's been talking about. O foolish Galatians, who bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth as crucified among you. This only what I learned to you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Past tense, you received the Spirit. And he says, this is the blessing of Abraham. You've already received it. You received what justification was designed to give you. You've already received what justification was designed to give you. See, what the, what the people who make the incoherent separation between works and free gift and there's a grace system and a work system and you're under both and you're under law and grace and you're a son and an heir but you're out working for a wage and you don't know if you're going to have the wage. What they've done is they've had to redefine justification and say, that's for future, and it's not for blessing or reward, it's for life. And really, it just means forgiveness of sins. 
It's all about sin to them. But Abraham, when justification came to him, God didn't even mention sin. He mentioned inheritance. Blessing and your seed shall inherit this land and kings shall come forth from your loins. That was all included in Abraham's justification without reference to sin. Interestingly enough, uh, it's subjecting the world to come to him. Heirs of the world to come. Let's see. Let me look at that phrase real quick. Uh, he says, uh, for the promise, verse 13, and that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but by the righteousness of faith. For if they that are of the law be heirs, faith is made of void and the promise no effect. What is justification? Well, for Abraham, it subjected the world to come to him. And same with David, but even more. It gave him a throne. He put his seat on the throne who was going to be the son of God, who would rule the nations with a rod of iron and receive them as an inheritance uh, and would live forever. M many more details, right? But it's still the same seed. It's all got to do with Christ. But now we, being blessed after the resurrection of Christ, have been baptized into Christ, who is the seed to whom these promises were made. And our justification secured the blessing, which is the world to come, but also blessed us so that we have received the Spirit. Past tense. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or hearing of faith? Now, again, receive the Spirit is past tense here. What does that mean? means I'm already blessed. I'm already crowned. I've already received the earnest of the Spirit, which is the pledge guaranteeing the redemption of the purchased possession, guaranteeing the inheritance. Right? Ephesians uh, 1, uh, 12, that we should be, let's see, in whom we also have been, 11, we've obtained an inheritance, past tense, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first in trust in Christ, in whom he trusted, after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of the promise. This is the promise of the Spirit, which is the blessing of the gospel, the blessing of Abraham, which is the earnest, the guarantee, the pledge, of our inheritance, of our inheritance, guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Once you get into the New Testament epistles, after the resurrection of Christ, you do not see the words taskmaster, wage, earning a wage, working in the field, keeping commandments, working for a penny, Okay, you don't. What do you see? An inheritance that has been guaranteed and secured by justification. And what, do, what have we received as a token or a pledge that guarantees the inheritance? Something called the blessing of Abraham, which was secured how? By justification through faith. When? After we believed. And what is it? The spirit, which is what? The blessing of Abraham. And that blessing is a pledge, a foretaste. Uh, it is a pledge giving us a taste of the inheritance. No, I don't taste it in full yet. But that taste is what motivates me today to love Christ. It betrothes me to him and reveals him and his goodness to me. So that I delight in him and he becomes my life because I find out that he loved me and gave himself for me. We're no longer talking about a taskmaster who's asking something for, from me. We're talking about someone who has given himself to me while I was ungodly and his enemy. He reconciled me to himself. He gave himself to me. He gave his life for me. He commended his love to me while I was yet a sinner. He died for me while I was weak. He died for me, and in doing so, when I believed, I became 
a son and an heir. I was baptized into him, and I was raised up and seated in the household at the table. I'm no longer a slave. I'm not under the wage system. Okay, this is why we have to rightly divide the word and go, okay, what was revealed when? And what revelation governs my life? I'm not going back to the weak and beggarly elements to dip into the wage system presented in the parables to figure out how to serve. I don't need to be motivated with the carrot and the stick of fear of judgment and promise of wages to serve God. That just proves that I have to be motivated by my appetites because I'm in the flesh and I serve my appetites. I don't care for Christ. But when I'm betrothed to Christ through the New Testament ministry and I see the beauty of what he's done, I fall in love with him. And I want to see my brothers and sisters get the burdens off their backs so that we can enjoy our inheritance together because I know that there is something called the fullness of God and the habitation of God that the more people are enjoying this fellowship together, the more that taste is realized in this age. Yeah, we get to taste, taste it in full in the age to come, and a lot of people are just wanting the rapture to come so bad because their life is so miserable. But the Lord really also wants to have a group of people have a taste of the blessing today because it's a witness. They become a lampstand to shine. You know, the gospel is not just for one person to go out and yell at people. The evangelist is for the equipping of the saints unto the work of the ministry, unto the building up of the body. And the body built up becomes a lampstand to shine because they're saturated with the blessing of Abraham, the spirit. And he says, I pray that you be strengthened into the inner man. Uh, I, uh, according to the riches of his glory, that Christ may make his home in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love would be able to apprehend with all the saints what are the rich riches, uh, I'm sorry, what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge so that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond what we ask or think, to him be glory in the church forever. That's a prayer for this side of eternity for a group of people to apprehend and to love the love of Christ and be filled under the fullness of God at, by the Spirit because of the habitation of God in Spirit. What's the Spirit? Blessing of Abraham. How was it received? Justification. It is the reward because what did God say to Abraham? He said, Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield. And your exceeding great reward. And he said that in the same chapter where he made the covenant with Abraham's seed. In which Abraham believing was justified. Where we get justification from, God put the inheritance and the reward. Because it's the same thing. Colossians says you uh, will receive the reward of the inheritance. Again, in the New Testament, we find a... Uh, a union of reward and inheritance both are incorruptible both are christ's and they're from his life and they're received by justification not by works but by grace there is a service or a work in uh, the house that the heirs perform but it is a work unto the building up of the body of Christ that is not a work for an inheritance, but is a sharing of the inheritance they've already received among the heirs that causes them to be built up. And that becomes a memorial so that, yes, there will be a memorial with Paul's name on it in the new city, Jerusalem. There will be a taste of Paul's work. How many saints are going to be so thankful for Paul's ministry? And how much of the New City Jerusalem is going to have been the result of his fruit? That's his reward. See, if you build something, the, the built up product is the reward. That's what we do. You know, when you build a city and somebody gives you a trophy 
You don't go stare at the trophy. That's stupid. Look at the city. What I want, if I build a city, I want an apartment where I open the window and I can see the city I built. That's the reward. The city is the reward. The new city, Jerusalem, was the inheritance and the reward, and that city is a person. It's God in Christ. It's the wife of the Lamb. It's God in Christ in his regenerated people who have been transformed and built up to express the triune God. And that was the city whose builder and maker is God that Abraham was willing to dwell in tents and count everything as loss. Just like Paul was willing to count everything as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And this is what we talk about. And yeah, we serve and we motivate. And we do talk about service in God's house. And we do talk about Christ in the church. But people who are oriented by the carrot and stick, because we don't use threats and uh, punishments and promises of treats, because we're not talking to dogs and slaves, they think we don't talk about service and obedience. And it's like, well, you're just blind. I don't know what to tell you. You need to repent of lying about our teaching and not listening to the ministry of the word. You're the one who's rejecting the scripture, not us. Uh, meanwhile, if you're so good at teaching on these things, let's hear you teach on them. Teach through Ephesians 4. Let's see what you come up with. I guarantee you're going to take it out of the context of Ephesians and attach it to some something in Deuteronomy or something like that. You're going to have to twist the word to get it to be, fit your wage system. Now, we need to rightly divide the word and come out from under the law and that incoherent mix and take our stand in justification, which has already secured everything for us, and take a stand as sons and heirs. And then we will serve in the spirit of sonship and in the newness of the spirit, not the oldness of the letter, as sons and heirs. And we do make ourselves servants. Not slaves of God, but servants of men. For Christ's sake, to liberate them from the spirit of bondage and fear and bring them into a taste of their inheritance so that we can taste it together with them and it's driven by a thirst for fellowship. We write these things to you that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we write these things to you that our joy may be full. It's for the spreading of the joy and the thanksgiving and the grace. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Talk to you later.